I believe that everyone deserves to live in a home with fresh, clean air, not just people who are rich or lucky. A really helpful device for achieving healthy indoor air is an energy recovery ventilator, or ERV. ERVs draw filtered, temperature and humidity controlled outdoor air into a home and exhaust stale air for year-round ventilation in almost any climate. Thanks to the incredible work of people like Powell Mietzel, an indoor air quality researcher, we're learning just how important it is to dilute the stale air in your home with fresh air. Powell's research group observed that the amount of volatile organic compounds indoors was 100 times higher than outdoors. Further emerging research indicates that many of these compounds can be harmful. Ventilation is the most effective way to lower their concentrations, and ERVs are the safest way to ventilate. But you know that already, and that's why you're here, probably. Today, I will show you my DIY installation of an ERV. This installation method is intended specifically for homes without ducted HVAC systems. In fact, you don't even need to own a home at all to use this method. It works in apartments too because it does not require you to make any alterations to your home. It doesn't even require power tools. Welcome to the Healthy Home Guide. This is a place where I share practical, budget-friendly tips for creating a safe and healthy home. Whether the word home refers to your house or your body. Please go ahead and like this video and subscribe because it causes the YouTube algorithm to shine its wandering eye upon my channel. Now to explain the rationale behind my method, I'll start by asking a question. Given that the HVAC industry protocol is to install ERVs within a ducted system, what do I do if my home does not have a ducted system? Well, if I own my home, I could have a ducted system retrofitted in. Although if my home wasn't initially built with ducts, it's extremely expensive and difficult to do that job properly. I was quoted in the range of 40 to 50,000 USD to do that for an 1800 square foot house I used to own. That was too expensive for me and I definitely couldn't do that job myself to lower the cost. Even if I could, these days I'm a tenant renting an apartment and I obviously can't have a ducted system installed because this isn't my home to alter. So my next question was, if I can't have a ducted system installed, is there another way to use an ERV? Well, this is where they tend to tell you you're out of luck, but I refuse to accept that answer because I want healthy air. So how do I install an ERV myself? Well, first I need to think about the interface between the outdoors and the ERV. Given that I'm not making alterations to my home, the only feasible interfaces to use are the windows. So can I install a simple intake and exhaust port in a window? To figure this out, I did some digging. Here's what I found. HVAC industry guidance generally states that your intake and exhaust port should be at least 10 feet apart to help ensure the incoming and outgoing airstreams don't cross contaminate. However, putting the ports at least 10 feet apart is an issue for me. The way my apartment is laid out to do so, I'd have to run ducts throughout my living space, out in the open, and make multiple window inserts. So naturally, my next question was, can I avoid that extra labor in the aesthetic nightmare by making one intake and exhaust port in one window? To answer this, I did some more digging and found that there is actually a precedent for intaking and exhausting in close proximity. Here are two Brone products that do so called Tandem Transition Kits. They're not intended for use in a window, but they do exhaust and intake in surprisingly close proximity. They can both be used with ERVs and have passed testing for their cross-contamination rates. This one exhausts air from here and intakes from the bottom, so the streams diverge vertically. Here's a more detailed view. This one exhausts air in one direction and intakes from the other, so the streams diverge horizontally. So there is a precedent for this sort of port, and both horizontal and vertical divergences are okay. Basically, if I make a device like this, the intake and exhaust vents should face in different directions. Although I don't want to put my exhaust and intake as close together as these products have them if I can help it. So next, I went about choosing an ERV. I went with the Brone AI Series 130 because it produces the correct airflow for my small to medium sized home. It takes MERV 13 filters to remove harmful PM 2.5. It automatically balances the intake and exhaust airstreams and is widely used and well regarded in the HVAC industry. My next question was, does Brone have any thoughts on using the AI Series 130 in a window? So I asked this question to a bunch of their tech support people, and they declined to comment because they can't legally approve of an application they didn't test for. Understandable. So yeah, to be crystal clear, Brone did not say that they recommend installing an ERV in a window. So please don't go asking them about this, okay? 
That being said, I personally didn't see an issue with trying it as long as it's done properly. Which brings me to my next question. What should my window port consist of? Well, here's a picture of my design from an outdoor perspective. The body is constructed of a corrugated plastic insert, sized to my window and sealed with weather stripping tape to prevent air infiltration. I decided to use Coroplast because it's cheap, easy to cut, lightweight, durable, moisture resistant, recyclable, easy to find, and non-toxic. My window slides horizontally so the insert is oriented as such and I use 5 inch round soffit vents for the intake and exhaust ports. Here's an indoor perspective. I'll be attaching 5 inch insulated flex ducts to these vents and connecting them to my ERV which has 5 inch ports. As I mentioned, to avoid cross contamination the vents face away from each other 3 feet apart. This exhaust vent is oriented so that it blows air upwards and the intake vent sucks air from below. I removed the insect screen from the window because that can cause cross contamination as well since it creates a single chamber enclosing both vents. When doing this project, I was careful to ensure rain doesn't come into my vents. My exhaust vent is facing upward, so rain could trickle into it if my home didn't have this eave above. So if I didn't have eaves or my eaves were really short, I might have wanted to use these vent hoods which are larger and less convenient to install but block rain more effectively. If I had horizontal windows and no eaves, here's a potential setup with vent hoods facing in different directions but still tilted downward to allow rain to run off. If I had vertical windows and eaves, here's a potential set up with soffit vents facing in different directions but still tilted downward to allow rain to run off. And finally, if I had vertical windows and no eaves, here's a potential setup with vent hoods facing in different directions but still tilted downward for the rain. I think these designs should give a good idea of the kind of approach I used here. I acknowledge that there could be better designs. Without further ado, here is a POV step-by-step -step build video with overdub narration for ultimate clarity. First, to determine what length the Coroplast insert should be, I'll use a tape measure to measure my window and I'll make sure to extend the tape measure to the furthest borders of my window to minimize air infiltration. 47 inches is my length so I'll add an extra inch onto that to make it 48 because it's easier to trim it down than it is to add onto it. Now I'll have to cut the insert. The Coroplast sheets I bought are less than 48 inches long so I'll need to glue together two sections to reach 48 inches and doing so will create a double layer of Coroplast which yields the added benefit of better insulation than a single layer. Before I do that, I'll need to determine how wide my insert should be. I obviously want it to be wide enough to fit the vents and there also needs to be some extra coroplast on either side of the vent. The reason for that is because a lot of windows have these lips and the insert is going to rest in here so the lip is going to extend past part of the insert and I don't want it to get in the way of the vents. There's also a lip on the bottom of my window so I'll have to give enough space to avoid that as well. So I'll leave two unbroken Coroplast channels on either side of the vent. And I'll mark the bottom of the third channel because that's the one I'll cut. And with another piece of Coroplast, I'll do that same thing again. So I'll leave two unbroken Coroplast channels on each side and I'll mark the bottom of the third channel. Either a utility knife or a Cora claw are both useful tools for cutting the marked channel. And with my Cora claw, I'll stick the inner prong into the channel and drag down and I'll do the same with the other section. Here are the two sections of the insert. I'll lay one on top of the other and adjust until they equal 48 inches together. Again, just a little more than I need. And I'll mark on the bottom section where the top section terminates just so I can find the correct position when gluing them together. Using alcohol to clean the parts, I'll glue for a stronger bond. Now I'll put hot glue on the surface of the bottom section below where I marked and quickly position the top section just below where I marked. And pushing down for a strong bond. After letting it dry for a minute or two, I'll put a line of hot glue in between the edges and pushing down each time. Now the other edge, pushing down again. Now I'm going to test it in the window and it's a little big just like I planned. So with a utility knife, I'll trim in small increments until I reach the desired length. Now I'll position my soffit vent centered on one end of my insert so I can draw a circle around its duct end. This area of the insert has only one layer of coroplast so it's easier to cut a hole in. And drawing the circle around the duct end and you can use any writing implement you want. Check it out.
and do the exact same thing on the other end of the insert. Check that out. Next, I'll cut a hole out with a utility knife. I can get the smoothest, easiest cut by pressing down relatively softly on my first pass and only cutting the top layer of coroplast. Then on the second pass, it'll be easier to cut the bottom layer of coroplast. When I cut, I go slowly and make sure not to cut myself. And now pop that circle out. Satisfying. And now I'll do the exact same thing on the other end of the insert. and popping that circle out, that feels good. And now I'll clean around the holes so my vents will glue around them properly. And cleaning my vents as well. You'll see how I'm gluing them shortly. So I have two vents, one's gonna go here and one's gonna go here. In my situation, they'll be facing in exactly opposite directions. So one will appear to be blowing that way and the other the opposite way. After orienting my vents correctly, I'll pop them down into the holes and the other one. So you can see that they would appear to be blowing in opposite directions. Now I'll use my hot glue gun to glue the underside of the vent to the insert. So first I'll have to push down a little bit to create a space and then glue all around. I sped this footage up a bit. Then I'll push the vent and insert together to bond them. Then I'll do the same to the other vent on the other end, so pushing it down and then gluing underneath all around, and then pushing the vent and the insert together to bond them. Then after flipping the insert over, I'll glue the other side around both vents where the vents meet the insert, and uh, making sure to glue all around just so it's air and water tight. And after waiting a minute for the hot glue to dry, I'll put my insert in my window. This vent will intake fresh air from outdoors, and a duct will connect it to this corresponding port with the damper. And then this port up here exhausts stale air to outdoors, and a duct will connect it to this port. And now I'm going to have to cut insulated flex ducts to the proper lengths. I use insulated because these two ducts will interface with the outdoors. This is the flex duct. I made sure to stretch it out because it comes compressed. I'll measure from the lower vent first, so taking the duct over, putting it up to the vent, and then estimating where I'll have to cut and marking there. I want my flex duct to have gradual curves, like this, look at this, for proper airflow, so I'll position it thusly when determining where to cut. Again, I'll estimate just a bit over the amount of duct that I think I'll need because I can cut it down to size but not add on to it. So I'll really stretch out both the outer jacket and the inner duct. This next step is important. So I'll pull the inner duct out so there are around six of its rings showing. Later, I'll need three extra rings poking out each end. You should pull out more rings than I filmed here. I didn't use HVAC gloves for this, but I should have. Anyway, to cut the duct, I first used a knife with a sharp tip to poke through and then a serrated knife to cut it. If you have a duck knife, that would be even better. I'm being extremely careful here not to cut myself. Then I'll use snips to cut the wire in the flex duct. And then cutting any remaining material away. And pulling the inner duct out so three rings are showing and tucking the outer jackets over the insulation to prevent it from like going everywhere, you know? I'll do the same thing on the other end. So pulling the inner duct out, three rings, and tucking the insulation in. And there it is, looks like a hot dog. Yeah, I don't think it would taste like one. Now I'm gonna try to size the upper flex duct. Okay, so putting it up to the vent, upper vent. Again, flex duct should have gradual curves. So I'll position it like this when determining where to cut. Trying my best. And I'll probably cut down there to give it a little more length than I think it needs. So I'll cut it in the same way I did the previous duct. So a sharp tip to puncture it and then a serrated knife to cut it. Again, a serrated duct knife is the best tool for this job because it punctures and cuts it. Using a sawing action when cutting it instead of just trying to slice it 
and being really careful not to cut myself. A lot of people cut themselves doing this. And using snips to cut that wire in the duct, then you can fully separate. I'll do the same thing as before here. So pulling three rings out of one end and tucking in the insulation so it doesn't get everywhere. And here's the other side, which I already pulled three rings out of. Done. I took my insert out of the window and positioned it duck side up, putting a partially tightened Panduit strap around it. And next I want three rings of the inner duct slipped over the vent duct like this. Push those three rings all the way to the bottom. Oh, and just if you're curious, this duct that I'm working with is the shorter one, the fresh air duct and tighten the strap right above the three rings. By the way, I could have used the Panduit gun if I wanted it super tight, but I didn't use one and it feels secure. Then again, I'm pretty wiry, I'm stronger than I look. I'll make sure my insulation is even and pushed down so it rests just above the insert, you see that? And I'll take the outer jacket and do the same thing. And now I'll use foil tape to seal the jacket to the insert. Again, I didn't use HVAC gloves for this, but I should have because I cut myself on this tape. So I'll seal all around the jacket and push down on the tape to smooth it out and create a good seal. If you're wondering what that device strapped to my torso is, it's a phone holder because I film with my phone. I want to film POV. So that's what that is. All right, let's attach flex duct to the other vent. So this is the longer duct, the upper one. I'll take another partially tightened Panduit strap and place it around the duct. I'll take three rings and slip them around the duct, pushing them down all the way. I'll take my Panduit and tighten it just above the three rings. Again, you can use a Panduit gun if you really want it to be secure, but I was fine with that one. And I showed it this time, cutting the tail off the Panduit with the scissor. Yeah, I say scissor because like, I'm not gonna say pair of scissors, you know? It's so long. And like before, I'll make sure the insulation and jacket is pushed down to the insert and seal the jacket to the insert with foil tape. Am I supposed to say a scissors? Like, give me a scissors. It just doesn't work. Pair of scissors is way out of the question, of course. But anyway, I put my insert back in the window and now I'll have to connect the flex ducts to the ports on the ERV. Now I'm connecting my lower shorter duct to the ERV port with the black damper, which is the fresh air from outdoors one, in the same way I connected it to the insert. Yeah, I'm gonna save my voice and not narrate this. Cause you know, you guys saw me do this twice already. And my narration is so detailed. I'm, you know, I think that's pretty good. You must appreciate it. If you appreciate it, give me a like. And I'll tuck the insulation and jacket into that black port guard before I tape it. Yeah, that's a good angle. See? and then just tape it in the same way. Really make sure to smooth that tape out. Really do that all around. Now I'll connect my longer upper duct to the Stale Air 2 Outdoors ERV port in the same exact way. This insulation looks embarrassing right now. I promise I smoothed it out and made it better. See? And there's that trusty Panduit strap. Three rings, as always, slipping it over the port. Tightening the Panduit strap right above the three rings. Cutting that tail. You guys know the drill. You guys are pros at this point. If you're actually like following along and doing this installation yourself, you're a renegade. I salute you. Now I'll take my five inch aluminum flex duct and slip it over the stale air from building ERV port. I don't feel like there's a need for Panduit strap here, so I'll just tape it to the port. And I took two five inch round adjustable elbow ducts and positioned them over the Fresh Air 2 building ERV port and just sealed the connection points with foil tape. I could have used only one elbow duct as well. This is the setup with five inch indoor ducts. 
and this is it with six inch indoor ducts. The six inch ducts are a bit quieter here and the airflow is slightly better, but there isn't as big of a difference as I expected, likely because of the short duct lengths. I used a six to five inch reducer and a six inch adjustable elbow duct for the fresh air supply. Here's how it works. So the stale room air gets sucked in here and the fresh air gets blown out of here. So the stale air and the fresh air get sucked and blown in opposite directions. The fresh air gets blown upwards also, and the stale air gets sucked from the floor, maybe capitalizing on CO2's tendency to stratify. So this is all to minimize cross-contamination of the airstreams. So just to tie all this together for you guys, the stale air gets sucked in here from the room and exhausted outside through this upper duct and the fresh air gets sucked from outside through this duct and gets blown through this outlet into the room. Here's a tip. I made sure my insert is flush with the window to form a good seal, but if there are some gaps, it's not a huge deal because I'll be sealing the insert with weather sealing tape. First, I'll clean the insert with alcohol and then apply tape to seal any gaps. Again, because of the way the soffit vents are facing, the stale air gets blown outside in this direction, and the fresh air gets sucked from below, like this. So they go in opposite directions. This next point is extremely important, so I made sure to have gradual curves in my flex duct for proper airflow. So they go like that, instead of going like this. So you don't want any sharp turns. And, uh, you know, same with this one. Gradual curve. Well, here's a pro tip. Well, actually, not a pro tip, probably an amateur tip. These flexible cell phone holders are a great tool for supporting flex ducts so it gradually bends. So they can clamp onto whatever you want and you can adjust and bend this arm. And they have a part that holds as well, almost like a hand. I highly recommend that you buy this optional Brone MERV 13 filter instead of the MERV 8 filter it comes with. This one's a little dirty because I've been using this ERV for a while but here's how to install it. I actually put four bricks below my ERV just to elevate it a little. So unlatch the two latches on the bottom and lift the door straight upwards. Don't try to swing it open. It surprisingly doesn't open like that, even though you think it should. Listen to this cool sound it made. These flaps on the side of your filter should be flipped out at a 45 degree angle like this. First, you'll have to slide out the Merv 8 filter it comes with then push in the MERV 13 filter gently. When I put in the filter for the first time, I had to wiggle it a bit to get it to fit. And there should be that arrow that you see pointing to the top. And put the cover back on. And relatch the two latches at the bottom. When this ERV is plugged in for the first time, it goes through an auto balancing process, which I'll show soon. But before plugging it in, close all the exterior doors and windows and turn off all the exhaust devices like range hood, dryer, bathroom fan, etc. Here's the control panel. The first time you plug it in, it'll automatically auto balance. But since I've already been using this ERV, in order to show you the auto balancing process, I'm gonna have to reset it. And to do that, I'll press this left button and this bottom right button simultaneously. And now it's asking me to confirm that I want to reset, and so I'll hit the left enter button. Now it's testing the maximum airflow that my setup is capable of delivering. Within less than a minute, auto balancing is complete, and you can see that my setup's maximum airflow is 100 CFM. Given that this machine is rated for 130 CFM, I called Brone's tech support to ask if 100 is acceptable. They said that 100 is right around what they'd expect in a real world application, and that 130 is what the ERV should deliver with no ducts hooked up to it at all, so I'm good. This blinking icon with the arrow pointing into the house means that the supply side is limiting my airflow. If the arrow were pointing out, the exhaust side would be limiting. So if you're getting a max airflow much lower than 100 CFM, that should help you determine where to start when improving your airflow. A common problem is having bends that are too sharp in your flex duct, bunching it up. Anyway, press enter, and the minimum from this test is 50, but you can set yours to what you want. Press enter. With this setup, you'll need to use the T1 configuration, so go down, 
And when you see T1, press enter. Press enter again and press the upright button to get to min mode, which is basically the standard mode that you'll use most of the time. And press enter again. And now the ERV will produce the airflow that you set for min. Let's talk about my spot ERV setup from an air circulation perspective. So fresh air is supplied from here and blows towards here. This fan blows into my office where the ERV is located. And that, again, is the fresh air supply outlet. So again, this fan exchanges the fresh air in my office with the stale air outside of my office. This fan blows into the master bedroom, also exchanging stale and fresh air. That fan blows upwards from the first floor to the second floor, and the air kind of rides this wall over here through the coanda effect and travels right to this fan, which disperses it to the second floor. Now going down, this is my puppy, Ricky. Like this video if you like calm puppies. This ceiling fan right here circulates air within this big space. So the kitchen and living room is all one space and it's divided by this, this big thing in the center. You see this thing. And while we're here, I might as well show you that this is my whole house dehumidifier. Uh, it blows out into this first floor. And then that's another reason why I have this fan here is to blow dehumidified air up to the second floor. Now I'll discuss the process of testing how effectively this ERV setup ventilates my home. For testing, I measured CO2 concentrations. Here's why. If there are occupants within an indoor space who of course produce CO2 when they breathe, CO2 level can be used as a marker of how much air exchange there is between the indoors and outdoors because CO2 concentrations are much lower outdoors. In other words, CO2 concentration can be a proxy for how well ventilated a space is. However, I feel that presenting data that accurately reflects ventilation efficacy isn't as simple as just showing you a graph of CO2 levels over time. When measuring CO2 concentrations, there are so many variables that can influence results. For example, how many people are in the home, which room they're in, and whether air circulation fans are being used. So when measuring the data, I controlled the aforementioned variables. I also used control by elimination for extraneous variables that could affect CO2 levels. For example, no one used exhaust devices such as bathroom fans during testing. Here are the results. These tables contain average CO2 concentrations in parts per million in various rooms of my apartment, which is a 1489 square foot, two floor condo built in 1989. I tested two conditions. The first was with one occupant in the house, me, and the second was with two and a quarter occupants in the house, me, my girlfriend, and my puppy, the quarter. I tested in three different locations. My office, which is 110 square feet and is where the ERV is located, the master bedroom, 220 square feet, and the living room slash kitchen, 483 square feet. Of course, I did tests with the ERV on and off and with and without fans for air circulation. The ERV was set to 55 CFM intake and 45 CFM exhaust. In all of these aforementioned conditions, the exterior doors and windows were kept closed. Notably, the interior doors to the rooms were kept open. I repeat, the interior doors to the rooms were open. I left doors open because I wanted to see how air diffused through my apartment. When you close the doors to the rooms, there's far less air exchange between rooms and only a negligible amount of fresh air would have made it out of the ERV room, my office, in the first place, making the experiment pointless. Anyway, I took dozens of measurements for each condition on different days and took the averages. To measure, I used an Aronet 4 CO2 monitor. And without further delay, let's talk about the results. First, let's focus on the ERV averages table in the bottom left, which contains average CO2 concentrations calculated from the data above. As you can see, overall CO2 level is much lower with the ERV on than off, with 780 ppm versus 1061 ppm. Moving directly to the right to the fan averages table, overall CO2 level is also much lower with the circulation fans on than off with 825 versus 1016. So there is a CO2 reduction and in turn ventilation benefit of both my ERV setup and also air circulation. To further drill into this data, let's move to the ERV slash fan averages table in the bottom right. CO2 is lowest when the ERV and circulation fans are both on at 699 ppm. 
CO2 is a bit higher when the ERV is on, but fans are off at 861. CO2 is higher still when the ERV is off, but fans are on at 950. And finally, CO2 is the highest when the ERV and fans are both off at 1171. What does this tell us? Well, with this spot ERV setup, it's best to use circulation fans to supplement the ERV. If you use the ERV without fans, there is still a CO2 reduction benefit, but not as great, especially as you get further away from the ERV. Finally, if you don't use an ERV, using fans is much better than nothing when it comes to CO2 reduction. At this point, you might be watching this and thinking, what even is a healthy CO2 threshold? Well, according to many sources, CO2 peaks should not exceed 1,000 ppm. An 1,000 ppm threshold minimizes the symptoms of excessive CO2 exposure while also being easily attainable. But remember, 1,000 is not a healthy average. It's an upper limit. I prefer to shoot for average CO2 levels between 600 and 800 ppm, which my ERV and circulating fans help me achieve. Success. I'm just going to quickly explain a couple aspects of the raw data above. In these cells, there are null values, meaning I didn't test these conditions because I didn't want to coop up my girlfriend and puppy in my small office for prolonged periods of time. Another thing you'll notice about this data is, of course, that the more occupants there are, the higher CO2 levels will tend to rise. Next, I want to talk about some single occupant testing I did to show the effect of closing interior doors. I tested average CO2 concentrations with the ERV on and off, again, with my office door closed in both tests. Of course, CO2 level was much higher with the ERV off than on, with 1490 ppm versus 687. Going back to the previous table, if we keep the ERV off and compare CO2 levels in my office with the door closed versus open, they are much higher with the door closed, with again, the 1490 from the previous table versus 1032 here. If we keep the ERV off but add a fan blowing into my office, we're lower still at 871. These results suggest that closing a door to a room decreases air exchange between that room and the rest of the home. When ventilating a home with a spot ERV, it's necessary to keep interior doors at least cracked open. Now I'll discuss some qualitative observations. I've noticed that it smells a lot less in my home when the ERV is on. And this makes sense as the amount of VOCs indoors can be up to 100 times higher than outdoors. So diluting with outdoor air lowers VOC concentrations, removing odors. When the ERV is on, but I close the door to the room it's in, odors build up outside that room. So that's another indicator that interior doors need to be kept open. Other observations are that I'm noticeably less tired when I ventilate. I'm able to concentrate better, and my allergies aren't as bad, likely thanks to the MERV 13 filter I installed in this ERV. Disclaimer, so I don't have the money or the equipment for a true cross-contamination test, but I did the best I could at approximating one, and I think the results are really interesting. To test, I measured the CO2 concentration in ppm with an Aronet 4 in two locations in the ERV itself, the fresh air duct and the stale air duct, and two more locations outside, in front of my condo on the opposite side from the ERV, and in back of my condo on the same side as the ERV, 30 feet from its intake. Here are the results, 455 in the fresh air duct, 639 in the stale air duct, 426 outside in front of my condo, and 456 outside in back of my condo. The first thing that jumps out at me is the 455 in the fresh air duct, which is a little higher than I'd expect from just fresh air, which is typically around 420. And indeed, we do see 426 outside in front of my condo. So why is the CO2 concentration slightly elevated in the fresh air duct? Well, another number that jumps out at me is 456 outside and back of my condo. That's also higher than I'd expect from fresh air. And again, that's 30 feet away from the ERV port. Given that the industry guidance states that the intake and exhaust vents must be 10 feet apart, I'd expected that 30 feet would be more than far enough away to avoid an elevated CO2 concentration relative to what I'd expect from fresh air. So what do I think happened here? So from the exhaust to the intake, I don't think there is a direct feedback loop per se, but what I think might be happening is since there are three condo units adjacent to each other, and almost all of their windows are here in the back, as well as my ERV exhaust vent, a cloud of CO2 accumulates back here and gets sort of held in place by this thick layer of vegetation, especially when the wind is still, which is a lot back here. And indeed, this effect is worse the lower the wind speed is. This is where I measured, again, 30 feet from the ERV port, and the CO2 concentration all the way 
way over here is so similar to that within the fresh air duct. So yeah, given all that, I don't necessarily believe that my intake and exhaust port design is the reason for any cross-contamination. Either way, 455 is still very close to an expected fresh air concentration, and it clearly doesn't affect the efficacy of my setup. Moving on, notice that the concentration in the stale air duct of the ERV is 639, which is similar to what I measured in the room itself, so I don't believe there's any major direct feedback between the supply and exhaust outlets. Of course, given that my setup is a spot ERV, there is bound to be some cross-contamination, I won't deny that, but it definitely does not hinder it from being an effective ventilation system. Now I'm going to talk about the limitations of my ERV setup. So although it's significantly cheaper and easier to install than a ducted system with registers in each room, it will obviously not distribute fresh air as evenly throughout your home. Properly designed ducted systems deliver fresh air directly to various rooms of your house, and my configuration delivers fresh air from one location only. Naturally, with my ERV setup, fresh air concentration will decrease the further you get from the ERV, especially if you have a larger home. It's wise to install your ERV in or near a central location where you spend most of your time. As I demonstrated earlier, to more effectively circulate the fresh air to areas further from the ERV, you can use fans. My favorite fans are AC Infinity's Cloud Lift series because they're super quiet and robustly built, but you can use any cheaper fans if you're on a tight budget. If you don't want to use fans, you may not need to if you have a very small home, or like I mentioned, you spend most of your time in one area of your home, like if you work remotely. As my test showed, air does tend to diffuse through a home on its own to some degree through phenomena like the stack effect. I do want to say circulation is a great idea for many reasons, but blowing air directly onto people can be uncomfortable, so try to avoid that. When circulating, take advantage of the coanda effect and position your fans so that they blow along surfaces like walls and ceilings, which carries the air streams further. Another limitation of my setup is that ERVs are somewhat noisy to have in your living space. Mine isn't that noisy. I run it continuously at around 55 CFM, and it sounds similar to a large air purifier on medium speed. It doesn't bother me much, but if you don't like fan noise, you can install it a little away from where you spend most of your time and you'll be fine. Now I'll discuss an extremely important limitation of all ERVs, no matter how they're installed. An ERV cannot single-handedly dehumidify your home when outdoor humidity is high. Even though ERVs modulate the humidity of the air that passes through them to some degree, they're not nearly as effective as a whole house dehumidifier at removing moisture from the air. I strongly recommend that you use a quality dehumidifier such as a Santa Fe in combination with your ERV in warmer months unless you live in an arid region. I'll be making a video about dehumidifier installation next. I appreciate you watching all the way until this point. Even if you skip till this point, I still appreciate you. Anyway, I have something I want to tell you guys. So I debated charging money for this video because it just took me so much time and effort to make, but I ultimately decided to show it to you for free. If you found this video helpful and you're able, of course, you're welcome to donate to me at buymeacoffee.com slash healthy home guide. The link is in the description. And really any amount is helpful. No pressure to donate, of course. If you want to support me, liking and subscribing is a really good way too. If you have any questions or comments, please do write them below. I really like to interact with you guys, so actually do that. Anyway, I'm really proud of this video, so thank you so much for watching.